Father Walsh. Your Eminence. Governor Peabody. Members of the faculty. Ladies and gentlemen. It is a, a great pleasure to come back to a city where my accent is considered normal. <laughs> and uh, where they pronounce the words the way they are spelled. <laughs> I take a special satisfaction in this day as the recipient of an honorary degree in 1956 from Boston College, and therefore an instant alumnus, I am uh, particularly pleased to be with all of you on uh, this uh, most felicitous occasion. This university, or college, as Father Walsh has described, was founded in the darkest days of the Civil War, when this nation was engaged in a climactic struggle to determine whether it would be half slave and half free or all free. And now, 100 years later, after the most intense century, perhaps, in human history, we are faced with the great question of whether this world will be half slave and half free, or whether it will be all one or the other. And on this occasion, as in 1863, the services of Boston College are still greatly needed. It is good also to participate in this ceremony, which has honored three distinguished citizens of the free world, President Pusey, Father Bunn, and our friend from the world of freedom, Lady Jackson. Boston College is 100 years old, old by the lifespan of men, but young by that of universities. In this week of observance, you have rightly celebrated the achievements of the past. And equally rightly, you have turned in a series of discussions by outstanding scholars to the problems of the present and the future. Learned men have been talking here of the knowledge explosion. And in all that they have said, I am sure they have implied the heavy present responsibility of institutions like this one. Yet today, I want to say a word on the same theme, to impress upon you as urgently as I can the growing and insistent importance of universities in our national life. I speak of universities because that is what Boston College has long since become. But most of what I say applies to liberal arts colleges as well. My theme is not limited to any one class of universities public or private, religious or secular. Our national tradition of variety in higher education shows no sign of weakening. And it remains the task of each of our institutions to shape its own role among its differing sisters. In this hope, I am much encouraged by a reading in this last week of the remarkable encyclical, Pachim in Terrace, in its penetrating analysis of today's great problems of social welfare and human rights, of disarmament and international order and peace, that document surely shows that on the basis of one great faith and its traditions, there can be developed counsel on public affairs that is of value to all men and women of goodwill. As a Catholic, I am proud of it, and as an American, I have learned from it. It only adds to the impact of this message that it closely matches notable expressions of conviction and aspiration from churchmen of other faiths, as in recent documents of the World Council of Churches, and from outstanding world citizens with no ecclesiastical standing. We are learning to talk the language of progress and peace across the barriers of sect and creed. It seems reasonable to hope that a similar process may be taking place across the quite different barriers of higher learning. From the office that I hold, in any case,
there can be no doubt today of the growing meaning of universities in America. That, of course, is one basic reason for the increasing urgency with which those who care most for the progress of our society are pressing for more adequate programs in higher education and in education generally. It is for this reason that I urge upon everyone here and in this country the pressing need for national attention and a national decision in the national interest upon the national question of education. In at least four ways, the new realities of our day have combined to intensify the focal role of the university in our nation's life. First, and perhaps most obvious, the whole world has come to our doorstep, and the universities must be its student. In the strange geometry of modern politics, the distant Congo can be as close to us as Canada, and Canada itself is worth more attention than we have sometimes given. Cultures not our own press for understanding. Crises we did not create require our participation. Accelerating change is the one universal human prospect. The universities must help. Second, there is indeed an explosion of knowledge, and its outward limits are not yet in sight. In some fields, progress seems very fast, in others, distressingly slow. It is no tribute to modern science to jump lightly to the conclusion that all its secrets of particle physics, of molecular life, of heredity, of outer space, are now within easy reach. The truth is more massive and less magical. It is that wherever we turn, in defense, in space, in medicine, in industry, in agriculture, and most of all, in basic science itself, the requirement is for better work, deeper understanding, higher education. And while I have framed this comment in the terms of the natural sciences, I insist, as do all those who live in this field, that at every level of learning, there must be an equal concern for history, for letters, and the arts, and for man as a social being in the widest meaning of Aristotle's phrase. This also is the work of the university. And third, as the world presses in and knowledge presses out, the role of the interpreter grows. Men can no longer know everything themselves. The 20th century has no universal man. All men today must learn to know through one another, to judge across their own ignorance, to comprehend at second hand. These arts are not easily learned. Those who would practice them must develop intensity of perception, variety of mental activity, and the habit of open concern for truth in all of its forms. Where can we expect to find a training ground for this modern maturity, if not in our universities? Fourth and finally, these new requirements strengthen still further what has always been a fundamental element in the life of American colleges and universities, that they should be dedicated to the nation's service. The phrase is Woodrow Wilson's, and no one has discussed its meaning better. What he said in 1896 is more relevant today than ever before, and I close with a quotation from him. I offer it to you with renewed congratulations and in the confident hope that as the second century opens, Boston College will continue to respond as she did in her beginnings to the new needs of the age. It is not learning, said President Wilson, but the spirit of service that will give a college place in the public annals of the nation. It is indispensable, he said, if it is to do its right service, that the air of affairs should be admitted to all of its classrooms, the air of the world's transactions, the consciousness of the solidarity of the race, 
the sense of the duty of man towards man, the promise and the hope that shine in the face of all knowledge. The days of glad expansion are gone. Our life grows tense and difficult. Our resource for the future lies in careful thought, providence, and a wise economy. And the school must be of the nation. Boston College for a hundred years has been of the nation, and so it will be for the next hundred.